Julie Goodyear is without any doubt the single most famous talked about soap star in British history. This is Bert Lynch you're talking to. It's all right, kid, come on. Right, lads, get your kit off. I mean, if you think Bet Lynch's life was chaotic, wait till you get to Julie Goodyear's real life. Look how well that turned out. Disastrous marriages, a psychiatric hospital. When I was given 12 months to live, he could go anywhere and everywhere. What brought you back? Nostalgia. I mean, the big question tonight is, will we get the real Julie Goodyear? Does she know who the real Julie Goodyear is? She's going to give me absolute hell tonight. Piers, don't be cruel. Or you could be minus your testicles. <laughs> I've just heard that Julie has threatened that if I give her a hard time, she's going to have my testicles. Good year. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you? You look magnificent. You look rather cute. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, we thought it'd be quite fun to ask your friends, family and former colleagues to come up with very honest and revealing answers to questions, all right? I want you to try and guess who said this. She's a lovely lady, but don't cross her because she's got bolts bigger than a South African elephant and a mean right hook. <laughs> Is that my husband, Scott? <laughs> it is your husband. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Am I in danger of the right hook tonight? Well, we'll see, shall we? <laughs> <laughs> Hope not. Not on camera, surely. You've had this amazing life, both on camera and off it. When ah. you think about it, we've got to go through everything tonight. Oh, dear. How, how do you feel about that, about going over every part of your life? Not good. Do you think we'll get the real Julie Goodyear tonight? That's all you're going to get. Brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't normally ask my female guests about a certain part of their anatomy, but in your case, I have to make an exception because they were national institutions. I'm, of course, talking about... Newton your, and Ridley. Your Newton and Ridley. <laughs> <laughs> I knew he was going to say that. Which were named after the, the brewery, of course. Yes, they were. The camera lads would always... Uh, if they were doing a shot across, the bar would say... Julie, dip, don't dazzle. <laughs> you can really. What did dip, don't dazzle mean? Well, if I was standing with my shoulders back, um, that was dazzling. And if I dipped, they could get through more easily and get the shot. <laughs> <laughs> now, your Newton and Ridley attracted some very special attention when you went to a, a function at number 10 Downing oh, Street. Oh, dear. From the Prime Minister's husband. Don't. Dennis Thatcher. Tell me what happens. This is actually, this is genuine, right? What do you mean, right? I'm not making things up, am I? We're on telly. <laughs> An invitation came for me to go to Downing Street. For me to go to Downing Street. But it was during that visit, uh, Dennis was obviously a Newton and Ridley fan. <laughs> he was getting a little bit... Well, actually touching you. Uh, ish. In that direction. The Prime Minister's husband. Oh, stop great. it. <laughs> well, how do you think I felt? <laughs> anyway. Well, how did you feel? I stopped the knee coming up. Because that was your protective thing. Very hard, a like, very loud slap on his hand. And I thought, oh, that's it, Tower of London. <laughs> You've done it again, or as my mother always used to say, you could cause trouble in an empty house. How did he react? Well, it wasn't, you know, I looked across and there was Mrs. Thatcher, and she. And as I was saying, did you feel? Did you feel offended? Not at all. It was dealt with. Done. Did you? <laughs> Sorted. It's quite shocking that well, he would do this. Oh, you're very naive, aren't you, darling? <laughs> <laughs> Julie, let's take a look back at your reign as the Queen of British Soap. Do us a favour, will you, Carl? Drink up. Julie Goodyear is an acting phenomenon. Yeah, I'm just that blonde scrubber what works behind the bar. One of television's most famous female stars. Judy was a superstar from the day she was dragged screaming from the womb. Let's face it, 
there's rather a lot of me to see. To shout, I've arrived! Bonsoir, Marcel. She created one of the most memorable characters in British soap. Could just be your lucky night. No character is bigger than the street, but I would say that Bette Lynch maybe came close. You're right, better Patrick. than your photograph. Julie Goodyear is a performer. Julie Goodyear is a star. It's what she's born for. It's in her blood. As well as pints and the rovers, Julie's also pulled audiences of over 20 million with dramatic storylines. <laughs> It's wonderful playing scenes with her. Alec, don't. I don't want you to go. It's not me that's walked out on you. The eye contact was just riveting. As a writer, you could throw anything at Julie Goodyear. She has an immense capacity to draw out drama from a scene. So, what are we going to do about it? And comedy from a scene. You can still see it, though, can't you? Yes, but that's all right. I think it's supposed to. And then, of course, there was the look. She came up with the idea of the leopard skin for Bet. You had everything going. You had the, the hairstyle. Crazy earrings. The amazing eye makeup. Big, bold cleavage. Sorry, I'm late. Good heavens. It was just so right for that character. It's not easy wearing earrings this size. They could break my neck. <laughs> On screen, Julie was the nation's darling for 25 years. Off screen, Julie's life was unconventional and rocky. Life threw a lot of knocks at her. She had a tough time. She almost courted disaster. There were several engagements and four marriages. She was truly, truly her. And there were several relationships with women. It was very racy but she lived her life according to the, the people she found attractive. Whether it be man or woman, she falls in love completely and utterly. Julie doesn't fit into boxes. She's a one-off. Julie's roller coaster personal life started with her first husband. The relationship ended and he left her and son Gary to emigrate to Australia. It's going to change things, this, isn't it? Then, in 1973, Julie was making her name on Coronation Street as the Brassy Barmaid. Oh, oh! She met and married her second husband, Tony Rudman. She turned up in a gold lame dress, and she looked very, very glamorous indeed. But hours after Julie and her husband said, I do, he left the celebrations and her life. He went. He just left her in the lurch. It was unbelievable. The marriage was then annulled, and she just had to get on with her life. Honeymoon cancelled, Julie hid her pain at work. Neither the cast nor the viewers were aware of what she'd been through. Cheers, whatever that means. And then she suffered a nervous breakdown. You've had a nervous breakdown and you're working in an office. That would be tough. But I have a nervous breakdown and actually have to go into work on camera in front of millions and millions of people. I can't imagine what that would be like. It shows how strong a character she is to be able to do that, to go in and then use Bess as her armour. And I think she's used Bess as her armour quite a few times, to tell you the truth. A lot of Julie's life has been painting on a smile to hide the pain. You found that really hard, didn't you, to watch? I did. Why? Why? Because it's true. The, the, the second marriage seems an extraordinary story. You, you, this guy, Tony Rubin, you've been with him for over a year. You got married, it was a huge affair, loads of people turned yeah. out to, to greet you all, and then an hour after you actually get married, in the middle of the reception, he disappears. Was there any sign of it in his behaviour that he was going to do a runner? I was more concerned about Gary because the actual reason I had married Tony was because my son <clears throat> was saving up for a dad. Ah. Uh. And Tony seemed the ideal. Did you love him? Ish. 
it was more important to me that Gary had the right to have. I mean, let's just get the, the chronology here. So this is 1973, so you were 31 years old then. You walked into an NHS hospital barefoot. I did. Wearing a mud-splattered, blood-stained nighty. Yeah. Um, and you, you smashed up your home, but you couldn't remember that. No, I couldn't. So you'd had a complete breakdown. And yeah, do you, and do you think it was all a, a direct result of the wedding day? Of course. He, he's dead now, right? He passed away. How God you, rest his soul. I mean, how did you feel when you heard he died? Sad. Sorry. Piers, I, I will not allow bitterness to come into my life. But it's such a despicable it's thing It's a to wasted do, it? emotion. Let's, let's turn to, to a happier subject matter. Please. You, let's, let's go back to 1966 when you first got the part of Bet Lynch. Yeah. Your first day, you made a bit of an entrance because you parked in a place with hindsight you probably shouldn't have done. Do you remember? When you arrived in a lorry with a cement mixer on the back. Oh, I see. It's the glamour. It's all right. You will be laughing. And you parked bumper to bumper with don't, Pat, Pat Phoenix's oh, no, vintage don't, Rolls Royce. Please, no. <clears throat> so there's your great big grubby no, cement don't. mixer. I was waiting at the bus stop. <laughs> and one of my dad's mates, he pulled up and said, uh, and he was, uh, yeah, the, you know, the concrete mixer on the back mm. and this, that. And he said, do you want to lift? So I got in, straight to the front door, and pulled up bumper to bumper with Miss Phoenix in a vintage Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to get out backwards. <laughs> Short skirt, the lot. And she was the biggest star of the show, right? Oh, God. And she said through the side of her mouth, don't you ever try to upstage me again. <laughs> I didn't even know what upstage you meant. <laughs> I said, I won't, Miss Phoenix. <laughs> I won't. But was it, was it a dream job for you the first time? Because it didn't last that long, but was it your dream? Yeah. This From was the it. first episode. You just thought, this is where I... I'm having it. Got to have it, yeah. Did you like the fame that instantly came? No, being... no, I'm, I'm not interested in that. Well... <laughs> 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 no, I promised I'd be honest, and, and I am being... I thought it might be nice, you know, to be asked for an autograph. So I took Bet gear off, and I used to walk down Dean's Gate in my lunch hour to wait, you know. Somebody will ask me. Nothing. <laughs> One week went by, another week went by. Everybody else gets asked for autograph. And then suddenly he was there. And I thought, and I got a pen that day. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what he said? Mm. 30 bob for a quickie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for God's sake. You've asked some bloody questions in your time, but this so is a Lulu. Question. You've had relationships with men and women. <laughs> You were born in 1942 in Bury Infirmary in Haywood in Lancashire. Yeah. Your mother, Alice, was just 20 when you were born, and she and your father, George, split when you were six years old. Did you remember much about your father? Not really. No, because I live with my grandmother. Mm. So, no. To me, Bill Goodyear was my dad. Mm. Who, was, who your mum married, remarried. Yeah. yeah. When you were still in your teens, your parents took over a pub called the Bay Horse in Haywood. Mm. Just before they were going to move into that pub, that was when my grandmother died in the local canal. She'd been missing a few days. She'd been in the water for three days. She was covered in... There were blue bottles. You know, being in, in canal water for that length of time. There weren't chapel of rest then. And I just... I remember walking into the kitchen and filling a bucket with water and getting a clean cloth. And you cleaned your grandmother's of, body? I certainly did. Very quietly. At the age of 13? Yes, I did. You've suggested that since then you've always felt your grandmother's spirit, that she's been like a guiding hand to you in your life. I think it's nice. It's a nice thing to feel that close. And I think... You know, I've obviously 
she's given me a great deal of strength. In 1959, when you were 17, you met your first boyfriend, Ray Suckler, and after a few dates, you had your first sexual experience ever, and you fell pregnant. Yeah. From that one first time. Did you panic? I mean, you were very young. Panic? <laughs> Shit myself. <laughs> Obviously, you decided in the end you were going to have this child, or was that decision taken for you? I could... I, there's no way I could have had him adopted at all. So the shotgun wedding. We've got a picture uh, from the wedding. That's you with, with Ray. Yeah. Again, looking very happy together, but he, he didn't hang around long. He went to Australia. Mm. And he left you to, to bring up Gary on your own. He did. Did you see him again? Never. Never, ever, ever. Gary is now 53. Older he's, than you. He's got three grown-up children of his own, your grandchildren. A pretty extraordinary journey you've been on with Gary in your life. How's your relationship now, would you say? I adore him. Of course. And, you know, he would no more have a part of this or anything else to do with the media. Mm. And I totally understand that. Yeah, we, we After wanted, what we, he's seen me go through. Yeah, when we asked for an interview, but he didn't want to do it, as, he's, as he and never And I don't has blame done. him. Yeah. At all. No. Julie, your life's certainly been full of drama. Julie Goodyear was born in the small industrial town of Haywood in Lancashire. She was the local stunner who, in 1966, landed a bit part as a factory girl in Coronation Street. It's all right, kid, come on. You just can't keep your trap shut, can you? After nine episodes, she was written out. Four years later, she was picked up again by Granada director June Housen. I knew I was about to produce Coronation Street, and I knew she would be perfect. And because she looked so good, I thought she'd be a very good barmaid. You know, where do those pumps go together like Malcolm and Wise? Wow, doesn't she look sharp, eh? She had something about her that made you turn around and look. Oops! Sorry, Captain. A story of my life, that always backing into things. All the strong women in the street up to that time had been, dare I say, grey. Suddenly, Julie arrived and there's this explosion of glitz and glam. Are you brewing that pint or what, Ben? I'm just warming it. I've only got one pair of flaming hands, you know. It broke the mould straight away. She represented an entirely new generation of working-class women who were becoming aware of their potential. Yes! <laughs> Listen who's talking. Within <laughs> ten years, Julie had taken Bet to the height of soap fame. Sit down, Bert. Make yourself comfortable. The moment Julie got the keys to the Rovers and became landlady was a huge moment for Julie. We think you're the right person for the manager's job. A milestone in my life, do you know what I mean? As though nothing's ever going to be quite the same again. She was the queen of the street. Alongside all the drama on screen, off screen, Julie's private life rivaled anything the writers could come up with for Bet. Maybe things are never meant to last. In 1979, she'd been diagnosed with cervical cancer. It must have been devastating. What a shock. And then you have a hysterectomy. It's like a nightmare, isn't it? I don't think she confided in anyone about that, except to her mother. A very sad time until she, she, she got the all clear. And in 1985, she married husband number three, American airline pilot Richard Scrobe. It lasted just two years. I need you to shake my head. Where have you found this one now? If there's something wrong with me, I'd rather not know. She lived the lifestyle of the Hollywood star, and that includes multiple relationships, divorce, ups and downs, traumas, drinking. And to add even more to the drama of Judy's love life, as well as the men, there were the women. The last was Vicky. I totally fell in love with Julie when I first saw her. She just had an aura about her. What grew out of that, the love we had between each other, it was like, wow, this is good. All the sort of same-sex revelations neither surprised me nor worried me. I mean, Julie was just Julie.
Then, after 25 years of her ups and downs, came the biggest revelation of all, when Julie Goodyear announced her decision to leave the street. Bet Gilroy has pulled her last pint in the Rover's return. I never thought she'd leave. I just didn't want to go into the Rovers without seeing her behind the bar. Sad. It was a shock for everyone that this thing that represented women's aspirations for 20 years was finally going to be gone. It was the right time for her to leave. She just felt it was the right thing to do. I do remember the, the scene when she left. There wasn't, there wasn't a dry eye in the house. I drove her back to her house, and when we got there, the front garden was just covered in flowers. It was amazing. I was sad for Julie, because it better become so much a part of her life that I hoped that she would manage without being bad. made you decide your time was up? Well, um, I had done 25 years. Everybody, when I joined, because they were much, much older than me at the time, I'd watch them finish work and go straight into a nursing home. Mm. And I didn't want to do that. I was more concerned uh, that I could have some of my own life. I know what the press was saying, of course. Well, but no, I just wanted to do my own shopping. I mean, the, <laughs> <laughs> the press was I mean the, it. The press were claiming at the time that it was because the street was about to go to more days a week, the work schedule would be harder, they weren't no. going to pay you more money. It was a bit of a dispute like that. Right. Not true. Not true. You just had had enough. It wasn't that I'd had enough. I wanted some life of my own. 19.2 million people watched your departure. Um, That's probably half the adult population of the country at the time. Uh, Extraordinary. It is. It is. Let's talk about relationships. Yeah. Do, you, do you know your sexuality? What? <laughs> you can understand me being a little confused. Oh, for God's sake. You've asked some bloody questions <laughs> in your time, but this is so a Lulu. Question. You've had relationships with men and women. What do you think about... A relationship can be a friendship, a soulmate, whatever. You don't have to have sex. Really? All the time. No. Just talk amongst yourselves. All this to go. What's the matter with you? But you have had sexual relations with men there and women. There are many gay people who work in the industry we work in. Right. Have you no gay friends? Yes, of course. What's it like having sex with them? I don't. <laughs> Neither do I. Really? Let me tell you. There was a time when I thought it might be worth a try. No good at it. Because I can't stop laughing. <laughs> okay. Which is why... Rewind Which is why... <laughs> they only are ever talking, gave me... They are we only talking ever with gave men or women? Me anybody. Right. Which is why they only ever gave me one bed scene in Coronation Street. Because it makes me laugh. <laughs> Even being in bed. Really? Bloody hell, you've not been around much, have you? <laughs> I'm still none the wiser as oh, to my original question. for God's question. sake, calm down. What you can find, and what I was lucky enough to find... Right. ..with Vicky, for instance... Yeah. ..who has recently retired... ..she has worked for me, and did work for me, for 23 years. You can't put a price on that kind of loyalty. Right. Right? Have you, on balance, had better relationships with women because they've treated you better? Well, I've told you about Vicky. Now, the picture that you flashed up, 
was a Scottish girl called Janet Ross. Mm -hmm. She and I became soulmates. I don't know if you've ever found that. I hadn't before or since. When my mother came to the last three months of her life, Janet Ross was like a rock. You don't often find mates like that. We've got, we've got a picture, actually, of Janet, now that you've, you've mentioned it. That's Janet. She was absolutely incredible. And she did that for three months. Day and night with me. Two years ago, I received a phone call from Janet. And she said, I need to talk to you, Julie. I was there within an hour. And we were sitting in a back garden. She said, you know, I uh, almost got the all clear when I... I said, yeah. She said, well, it's back. This was cancer she was talking about. Mm. My soulmate. And it was her turn now. For everything that she'd done for me with my mum and in my life. That's what I mean. We're not talking sex. Mm. We're talking good people, real people, kind people. And she died. Was she the, the love of your life, do you think? I wouldn't call it that. We were soulmates. Mm. We really were. Will we soon be going on to a high? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For God's sake. Do you want all these lovely people slashing their wrists or what? <laughs> this is... I mean, come it's on. It's your life. I know. I know, and I can only apologise. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I really am. In 1985, you became landlady of the Rover's Return. That's a positive moment. Yes! Now, you were at the centre of some of the street's biggest storylines, including a fire at the Rover's Return oh, that nearly killed okay. everyone. <laughs> but first, the song. <laughs> yes. That episode was watched by... This is actually true. Oh, that episode was watched by nearly 23 million viewers, one of the street's all-time oh. record. Yeah. Audiences. Another time you were stranded in the lake with Betty Driver. Uh, what did they give us to wear for that protective uh, clothing? Mm. A bin liner each. <laughs> <laughs> Two holes cut through to put our legs in. <laughs> we were waist deep in lake water for two days. They'd bored holes in the side of the car so it would sink quickly. From the back, I could hear Betty. Oh, she said, Julia. I could do with spending a penny. I said, I've done it. <laughs> she said, you've not. I said, does it make any difference, Betty? There's all sorts in this bin liner. Sticklebacks, <laughs> frog spawn. <laughs> she said, yeah, well, even so. My God. <laughs> Whether she did or not, I don't... Probably not. <laughs> Did you regret going back in the end? I was asked to go back as a favour. <laughs> at the age of 37, you were at the yeah. height of fame in the street and you were diagnosed with cervical cancer. I mean, that is a huge... Yep. Huge thing to have happened to you oh. at, the, at the height, really, of your fame in the show. Yeah, it was. It was. It was like I, j I joined a mobile screening unit on a uh, car park, car park lodge at the back of uh, Granada. Uh, in a queue, we were all having a laugh, really. And uh, the results came through, I remember it was just before Christmas and it was positive. It was like a bombshell. 
What was the moment you were told you only had a year to live? You know, people needed to know how long I was going to be off work for. And I hadn't asked. But then it was, have you asked how long you're going to live? Mm. Um, I was given about maximum of a year. And it was the occasion where the student nurse came in. Mm. I was lying in bed, she came in, rubber glove, and obviously she'd recognised me straight away. She was sort of down there. And, you know, she said, what's Annie Walker like in real life? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you've not found her down there, have you? <laughs> <laughs> and she looked up and we both laughed. You see? Julie, you said goodbye to the cobbles of Coronation Street to follow a different path. After 25 years as Queen of the Soaps... Look how well that turned out. Julie Goodyear was out on Sibby Street looking for a job. I think she thought she was going to go on to do other things. She was quite optimistic. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Julie Goodyear. Julie was given a chat show format which didn't particularly go down very well. Right, lads, get your kit off. It was only shown regionally. Oh, look, that is fantastic, look. But that was a great disappointment to her. I remember saying she was very, very frustrated. Night, night, and God bless. She had certain expectations, but I think it's more difficult than you think to leave a character like that behind. As well as TV and film work, Julie was also looking for parts on stage and in panto. She was the first woman to play a dame role, which is traditionally played by a bloke dressed up in women's clothes. It's going to be hard, hard work. By 2002, after seven years away from the street and no major successes to her name, Julie was still open to offers when Coronation Street came calling. There was a sense that maybe the show had slightly lost touch with its roots, so one of the decisions we took was to try and bring back one of the iconic characters, and we pretty much came up with one name, and that was Julie Goodyear. The most famous barmaid in the country is returning to the programme that made her name Coronation Street. Watch out. There was a huge advertising campaign. Watch out, she's back. When she phoned me and said, cock, I'm coming back, I was like, oh, this is going to be good. I'm going to Weatherfield, cock. Pub called the Rovers Return, Coronation Street, if you know it. I had misgivings about it, I must be honest. Things had moved on. There were no rehearsals anymore. What brought you back? Nostalgia. You just appeared on the studio floor, ran through it a couple of times and then filmed it. And I thought, Julie's not going to like that. When Julie left Coronation Street in 95, the programme was going out three times a week. When she came back in 2002, it was just going to five times a week. <laughs> You're kidding. <laughs> You're not kidding. And that is a huge change in workload for anybody to suddenly adjust to immediately. It's not a way that she could work. It did take it out of her. And she, she, she was very poorly by the end of that week. <laughs> this is Beth Lynch you're talking to. She used to look shattered. She couldn't do it anymore. I then she took to her bed. They brought the doctor out to her. I thought she was going to have a nervous breakdown. Julie quit Coronation Street again after the 17 days back on the set. I remember I was out at the shops and I got a call from one of the first ADs and they said, um, we have a bit of a problem. Julie's unwell and uh, we don't think she's going to be in work on Monday or, in fact, probably not next week at all. She held her hands up and said, that's it. We wanted so much and hoped for so much, she found herself drowning. And I just think it's a shame that no one could throw her a life belt. She was as broken hearted about that as any relationship, because that had been a relationship that had lasted 25 years. To have to leave that behind, devastating. Did you regret going back in the end? I was asked to go back as a favour. So, yes, I do regret going back. You lasted 17 days in the comeback. Yeah. And then you clearly hit the wall and thought, I'm not doing this anymore. What were you feeling? What somebody had admitted to tell me 
in the transition period were all the changes that has happened. You know, the older members of the cast who'd been there since it had gone from three to five episodes had been eased gently into it. And the new kids coming in um, weren't used to working any other way. But when I, I walked in, it was like... It was like being on a, a conveyor belt. We'd always had rehearsal. We'd always had makeup and costume and everything. I had about 27 Rover scenes and we started at the end. Sorry? The end? I was used to mm. beginning at the beginning and building up. When you, when you walked out on the 17th day and knew you weren't coming back, did you feel not just regretful, but did you feel like you'd, you know, you'd lost, that you had failed? No. No, I didn't feel I'd lost or failed. I thought, it's time I put my health for the first time. Mm. First. Do you still watch Corinne's Tree now? Yeah. Religiously? I mean, do you watch no, it every no, night? No, 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 not religiously. I've got... I have too many other things to do, you know. Michelle Collins uh, is playing Stella Price, the, the current manager of the Rovers' return. What, what do you how make many, of her? How many landladies have there been? A lot. Since. Yeah. I was only the second. Do you, you like know? her performance? Yeah, of course. Do you judge everyone against bet? No. Not isn't at that, all. Isn't that human nature to do it? Well, it might be for somebody like you, but I'm not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't try and turn it into a love story. But it is a love story. Is it? Isn't it? <laughs> You've lived in the same town, Haywood in Lancashire, your entire life. Yes. Why? I know. <laughs> I'm curious. It Why? is unusual, isn't it? It's very unusual. No, I couldn't live in a city. Not at all. I, I need grass. I need down-to-earth, mm. real people. And, you know, I'm now to pound in Airwood. The most I'll ever get is, I, all right, love, you all right? Good. Oh. And I love it. I just love still being there. Julie, as you entered a new phase of your career, you're on the lookout for a new challenge. <laughs> After leaving the street behind her in the noughties, Julie appeared on our screens in a number of reality shows. Yes! When you watch her do the reality shows, she just has fun now. <laughs> There's something she fancies doing, she does it. I don't think she has any real inhibitions. There's never a dull moment. She's always up to something. She's always interesting. In recent times, Julie was cast in a comedy sketch show using her skills to create a number of characters a million miles away from Bet Lynch. Back! I just wanted to... Uh... Not yet! Cashier number one, please. She is an amazing actress. Julie enjoyed it enormously. She got to play a different roles. Do you still fancy me? I've never fancied you. I'm gay. And she was very good in them. There wasn't a hint of bet there at all. Have you ever thought of selling your body? <laughs> never. <laughs> I'd miss her too much. She is a very versatile actress. She is capable of playing anything. Somebody totally different from the role that she became as famous for. I can't. As well as new career opportunities, Julie also found herself a new home. She lives on a farm on a hill overlooking the countryside on the outskirts of a town in which she was born. I can understand why that's sort of her place of relaxation and comfort. She's got all huge fields of sprinklers and sheds and horses. It's always great fun. You know she's a member of the Farmers' Union. She's animal mad. That's the chink in Julie's armour, animals. And with the new home came a new husband, half her age. 27 years of age difference, that means nothing. 
I locked it up and fell in love at first sight. I'm just really pleased for her because when she's with him, she looks happy. I love Julia for who she is, not for what she's done. Julia and Scott finally married in 2007, 11 years after they first met. This is for keeps. She's happy now, she deserves it. I don't think he wants anything else out of that relationship except Julie. He's just happy to look after Julie and he just loves her implicitly. She's my wonder woman. Truly is. I remember when it, when, it, when it first came out about you and Scott and there was this 27 year age gap. You were 54, he was 27. All the papers, it'll never last, she's mad, etc, etc. Must be quite satisfying that you're still together 17 years later. It's all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true he proposed to you every single day for 10 years? 11 years. Mm. Why did you finally crack? Emotional blackmail. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you do realise... If you don't marry me, I'll never have been married. Because I'll never meet anybody who will ever match up to you. I said, oh, go on then. <laughs> <laughs> don't try and turn it into a love story. But it is a love story. Is it? Isn't it? We'll see. I might renew his contract. <laughs> Oh, you're being rough on old Scott. No, I'm not. You are? Only, no. He's been the best of a bad bunch. <laughs> <laughs> he really has. Any positives? I'm trying to think. <laughs> <laughs> he wants a job doing it. Half of it gets done. That's not a positive. Oh, even half's better than nothing, isn't it? Can you tell me one good thing about Scott? God. <laughs> You've got me there now. I'm doing my best. <laughs> this isn't the most romantic. No, it's not, is it? No. Well... He was very nice about you. Ha. <laughs> yeah. There you go. It should be. I'm wonderful. You're not conveying a picture of, of great <laughs> happiness here. You did. There's no need to go over the top. There's no need. Let's, let's just see. To see? You've been with him 17 years. Well, that's not the point. There's a lot of fellas, when that ring goes on, they change. Has he changed? Mm, ish. Mm, they can do. You have to be very careful. But has Scott changed? Well, to a certain extent. In what way? He has to be reined in. Reined in a bit. He's not one of your horses. No, they're adorable. We're getting to feel a bit sorry for Paul Scott. I Good. Mean, do you love him, though? Well, I must do. Or I wouldn't still be with him. And he hasn't left. He's going nowhere. Would you... OK, let me ask you a different question. Oh, <laughs> Is that the time? Would you say that you are... Are you happily married? Very. If that'll make you happy, I'm happy. God. Do you want to move on? Could you? Yeah. Now, you said that you've gone from queen of the street to queen of the muck heap. Do you, do you like life on the farm? Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. I collect waifs, strays. I've got cats with one eye, dogs with three legs. Is it because animals don't let you down in the way that Could be. humans do? Could be. Could be. But I absolutely love it. If I had the power to send you to a desert island for the rest of your life, but you could only go with one person from your entire life, living or dead, who would you go with? I'd probably take my mother's bus pass and go on my own. <laughs> Wherever I go, it doesn't matter, in the world, I always take a bus pass with me and put it into flowers or anything. And you'd rather be on your own than have somebody with you? Are you disappointed again? Not at all. I like the honesty. 
Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Now, look, I want to end by... This is just a personal ambition of mine, really. So I grew, oh, up, I grew up with Bet Lynch. But I want you to imagine I'm a customer at the bar of the Rover's Return. And I want to hear that famous greeting. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. So you've just come in, have you? Just come in. It's very difficult to do without leopard and a beehive, this. <laughs> Give it your best shot. Right. <clears throat> All right, cocker. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Julie Goodyear. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A few weeks ago, they wouldn't have known their cha-chas from their Paso Dobles. Now they're in the semi-final. Stepping out tomorrow at 6.45, then singing for a chance to perform in front of a 4,000-strong crowd at Wembley. Join Gary and the gang for The X Factor at 8. Then more celebrities have been foolish enough to give Keith Lemon access to their house. Through the keyhole is at 9.